Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to today's program. This is a joint Medical Grand Rounds and Medical Center Hour. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, and uh, it's our center that produces the Medical Center Hour. We're delighted to be joining for the first of three times this semester with the Department of Internal Medicine, um, whose Medical Grand Rounds this is. Our program is entitled After the Fall, a Tapestry of Disturbance, Recovery, and Resilience. Please come in. There are some more chairs uh, down in the front and over here. What connects the work of a tree biologist with that of a doctor? And what is a tree biologist doing speaking at Medical Grand Rounds, a conference specifically for internists and internists in the making? Or for that matter, at a medical center hour, a conference addressing health-related concerns shared by medicine and society. What about trees? And what can be learned from trees in faraway rainforests? What about that should matter to us in medicine? Today's program pushes those questions. As you'll see in this hour, there are connections. Surprising, perhaps. Significant, yes. Meaningful, certainly. And again, there are Seats in the front row down here, a few other seats. Please join us. Nalini Ned Carney, a tree biologist, is a pioneer in the field of canopy research and in public engagements about the plants and animals that live in the treetops. Her interest in rainforest dynamics and in such forests' response to major disturbances such as harvesting, fire, and climate change have prompted her over the years to inquire more widely into the phenomena of disruption and recovery, as these occur not just in trees and forests, but in people who fall ill or are displaced or become refugees, in communities ravaged by natural disaster, in complex systems that go suddenly and catastrophically awry. Professor Ned Carney, accustomed to quite freely traversing treetops, several years back began traversing disciplines, asking experts in other fields as far flung as economics, neuroscience, and traffic engineering what they know about disruption and recovery, and importantly, what they know about the generation of resilience, the ability not just to go on, but to flourish again anew. Unexpectedly, in 2015, her work proved personally useful. While doing forest canopy field work, Professor Ned Carney fell 50 feet from the top of a tree. She sustained extensive traumatic injuries. It was during her recovery that she began to mine further what she had gleaned from diverse fields about disturbance and the stresses and the opportunities it brings, about recovery and healing and all that they mean and about resilience and what it enables us to do, be we trees and forests, plants or people, arborists or internists, doctors, patients, communities. Nalini Ned Carney is professor of biology at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. She's also president of the International Canopy Network. This doesn't quite appear on her CV, but for her pioneering work, she's known around the forests as the queen of the rainforest canopy. I think this is the first time we've ever had arboreal royalty here <laughs> to talk with us. But please join me in welcoming Nalini Nitzharni. Thank you so much, Dr. Childress. And um, as, as you said, it's, it's sort of, I feel sort of weird being here, actually, as a forest ecologist speaking in this, uh, in this wonderful medical school. I really want to say, first, that I feel humble and grateful for the work that all of you do uh, in terms of caring for, being dedicated to, um, and learning about um, how to bring health to people. Um, as a recipient of amazing medical care just this last year, when I did fall out of a tree, I have to say I now really understand the importance of, of what all of you do, and I want to extend my thanks um, not to you, to your brothers and sisters in the profession as well. I also want to recognize my brother Mohan Nadkarni, um, who I think all of you probably know. Um, I know him very well as my little brother, and it's wonderful to see him in the context of his professional work here. Um, we do, however, 
me as a forest ecologist, you as people who, who understand and, and deliver medical care, I believe have topics in common. And this and the topic of disturbance and recovery is one that we do hold in common. Um, I, who see the interweaving of primary rainforests um, as a complex and important system that sustains life and ecosystem services in tropical, temperate, and boreal uh, forests around the world, but is subject to disturbances, um, as Marcia said, in terms of fire and insect attack, uh, as well as human activities. And all of you who are involved with the understanding of the tapestry of systems, of organs, of nerves, of bones, um, of blood uh, movement that make intact systems important to, to preserve and to restore when disturbance such as trauma or stroke or injury or assault uh, takes place. Today what I'd like to do is to apply what I call for myself the, the sort of the art and science of tapestry thinking. I take my inspiration uh, from this tiny little poem by Rabindranath Tagore. The tapestry of life story is woven with the threads of life's ties, ever breaking and joining. What I'd like to do with tapestry thinking is to, is to pull together seemingly disparate ways of knowing uh, from different disciplines, uh, different, using different tools, different theories, in order to understand difficult, sometimes wicked problems such as disturbance and recovery. Um, I believe that I come by this honestly. These are my parents. My dad is from India. He was a Hindu. Uh, he was a pharmacologist, a scientist, a, a, a quiet, dignified gentleman. My mother, uh, and the sorry there, is from Brooklyn, New York. She was raised as an Orthodox Jew. She studied uh, communications and languages. And so my four siblings and I really learned from birth that it's very easy, it's very important, and it's very productive to try to weave together different cultures, different languages. Uh, our favorite dinner was curried bagels, for example. <laughs> um, and so that was really kind of a problem growing up, and that's really what I've done um, through my professional life in terms of trying to understand uh, problems in forest ecosystems. I thought I would take this opportunity to share with you um, our family story, which is the five siblings, my little brother, the baby, uh, in the middle there, um, just so charming and sweet, and we all just dearly love so much and still do, um, who's now this important uh, mentor, teacher, educator, and healer here at the University of Virginia. Um, so he's part of this tapestry as well. In any case, what I'd like to do during my talk is to use this theme, this metaphor of tapestry. I'd like to do basically three things. First, to describe my own, uh, my own inspiration, which is trying to understand the complex tapestry of rainforest ecology, of rainforest systems. Um, which are subject to disturbance um, and hopefully recovery. But that is my own intellectual threads and help you understand why these are important to me and to my own community of forest ecology. Secondly, I'd like to describe the threat of disturbance and recovery that happened to me this last year when I fell out of a tree and the, the kinds of experiences that I sustained, that I experienced um, in terms of the healers that came to me that that I experienced in the hospitals and the ICU, and later on during the later stages of recovery, which I am still experiencing as well. And third, I'd like to um, use this idea of tapestry thinking in ways that I've enlisted the threads of understanding that come from other widely different disciplines who also try to struggle to understand that understand um, disturbance and recovery. And so I'll be sharing those as well with you as well. And finally, come to sort of conclusions about where we collectively, forest ecologists uh, and medical people might go to understand the processes of recovery after disturbance. Well, first, rainforests. Um, as a kid, I grew, I grew up climbing trees. As a graduate student, I chose to find out about the forest canopy. It was called the last biotic frontier. Because of our loss of prehensile tails, uh, we really haven't been able to get up into the forest treetops very well, and yet this is a very important part of forest ecosystems in terms of sustaining biodiversity. That is, many, many plants and animals live in the forest canopy that you never encounter on the forest floor. Many, many interactions between plants and animals occur in the forest canopy that you never see on the forest floor. And for that reason, it seemed to me important that we get up into the forest canopy to study it. And over the last 30 years, we've uh, developed, we forest canopy researchers have developed a number of ways to get into the forest canopy safely, or what I used to think is as safely, and, and, and uh, non-destructively to the trees. And I thought, because I can't bring all of you up into the forest canopy of, of here in Charlottesville, Virginia, I thought I would show you a very short clip of a forest canopy access 
uh, moment in Costa Rica where I do my most of my research um, to share with you not just the environment of what I see, what I find, what my questions are in the forest canopy, but also to demonstrate to you very vividly that my work depends upon my physical capacity to get up into the forest canopy. And so a disturbance that strikes my inability to get up there is a very significant thing. So here we go with uh, a, a bit of a film by the National Geographic Society called Heroes of the High Frontier. All right, how many of you medical students and residents would now like to start a life of understanding the forest canopy rather than you <laughs> I, I would like to see many hands. Anyway, during the 35 years that I had spent climbing trees with my students and my colleagues, we have come to understand that the forest canopy is not just the sort of remote part of the forest ecosystem, but rather it plays a tremendous role in terms of maintaining biodiversity of many plants and animal species. It also uh, performs ecosystem level roles in terms of intercepting and retaining nutrients and water that come in atmospheric forms. The plants that live in the canopy are very adept at holding on to these nutrients. They, as they grow, they live, they die, they then return these nutrients to the forest floor. So they're actually augmenting the nutrient cycles uh, of the forest as a whole. This was sort of the general idea that I have sort of pieced together over these last 35 years of forest research. But one of the concerns that has grown in me over the last five to 10 years has been understanding the, the fact that there's disturbance going on in these primary ecosystems that are negatively affecting the plants and animals that live in the forest canopy. Human activities such as mining, such as conversion of forest to pasture, forest fragmentation, uh, global climate change, are all having a negative effect on the functions that these primary forests have, have provided. And in addition, there's been this general shift as our population has moved from being primarily rural to primarily urban in the last two years. We actually fit more than 50% of our population now live in cities. So there's a growing distance between our connections, between uh, ourselves as humans and natural systems um, such as forests. And this is of, of grave concern to me, and I decided that one of the topics that I would like to spend a lot of my time studying now is one aspect of disturbance, and that is the isolation of previous primary forest trees as we create pasture systems. So this is a tree, for example, that was growing in a primary forest. A farmer has turned that into a pasture and has left several single trees living in those pastures because of for, for shade, for fruit, for medicinal plants, or for aesthetics. My question is, do those trees that are living in disturbance, these what we call relic trees, do they serve any purpose in terms of maintaining ecosystem function and biodiversity? Or are they in fact the living dead that don't really serve any purpose at all in terms of primary forest function? Well, it was during the research process of these relic trees in Ju on July 3rd, 2015, which was just last year, um, that I fell out of a tree. My rope failed suddenly, unexpectedly. I was with my students. I fell to the forest floor 50 feet. I didn't hit any intervening branches, but I just fell like a, like a silent sack of sand to the forest below. I was down on the forest floor. Clearly, there was something wrong, you know, definite things that had happened to my body as I looked up at the canopy. I waited for three hours. Uh, I was re uh, rescued by the medevac uh, services of the Harborview Medical Center, a trauma center, a fantastic trauma center in Seattle, Washington. And it was after that, really, immediately after that, that I began realizing that my world had changed, that I myself had been subject to a disturbance from which I could only hope to recover. And what I'd like to do now is to share with you some of the fears that I experienced, that especially in that early part of my recovery, that might reflect for you some information or provide for you some information about what a patient who has suffered a, a severe trauma, uh, a patient who has formerly been very active, formerly been very functional, severe, uh, um, suffers a severe disturbance such as falling out of a tree. And I've organized this in three pieces, uh, the fears of losses in terms of my life, and sanity and mobility, those basic fears that I think everybody would fear. I also feared that my connections that might be severed to my fellow human beings, my family and my friends, but also to nature, something which is fundamentally important to me, not only in terms of work, but in terms of my spiritual life. And third, I, thought I, suffered, I feared the loss of my own functions, my own identity. Who am I? 
How do I operate in this world? How do I function as a parent, as a wife, as a person, as a colleague? What's going to happen to me now that I've suffered this, this disturbance? So first I'll tell you about sort of what went on in terms of this first primary set of fears of life, sanity, and mobility. And my first reaction was, oh my gosh, this is a terrible catastrophe. This is the equivalent of a forest fire in my life where life has been extinguished. That, that life could potentially be extinguished, that life as I know it has been ended. I was in the ICU for a week. Uh, my brother Mohan came out. He was incredible help in terms of communication. But essentially I felt that, and the people around me felt that, Nalini was very close to death. In fact, some of my relatives and friends who came were really, they told me later that they were expecting to be there uh, to kind of be attendant at, at my exit from this world. Uh, I suffered actually uh, nine broken ribs, a fractured pelvis in three parts, a burst uh, T3 to T7 uh, vertebrae, so I have a spinal fusion now, a lacerated spleen which has since been uh, removed, a punctured lung, a broken fibula, and mild uh, traumatic brain injury. So those were the sort of physical things that happened to me uh, that were fixed to some extent physically um, in the ICU. The ICU for me was terrifying. It was terrifying not only because I was feeling uh, about facing death, but it was also terrifying because I felt that I had lost my mind. And in fact, I had lost my mind. I suffered these hallucinations. There were some very real hallucinations. I imagined or pictured an African-American soldier with a rifle behind that green curtain who was pointing that rifle at me and my son. And in fact, my son was sitting between me, the, 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 the soldier and me. And instead of trying to protect my son, to my horror, I just let him sit there. I mean, what possible horrible, more horrible thing could a mother imagine about herself that she didn't protect her own son? I also imagined, or felt, or hallucinated that this nurse, this very competent nurse, was doling out poison pills to me. That the pills that I was receiving were poison rather than something that might help me. And so this made me question everything I knew about what I knew about myself, which is that I'm a sane and logical person. At one point, I overheard nurses in the ICU talking about my potassium levels, that they were low. And I was intubated, so I couldn't speak. I couldn't communicate. My voice could not be heard. But I wanted to find out what was going on with my potassium levels. And I had read the biography of Helen Keller when I was eight years old. And in the back of the book, there was a page that, that taught me the deaf mute alphabet. So I kept signaling K, 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 tell me about my potassium levels. But they didn't understand what I was doing. And so again, I felt completely silenced in my intellectual efforts to try to help myself through this very difficult time. So that time in the ICU was a time of fear of loss of life, of loss of mobility, and loss of my sanity. I was also very afraid of my, the loss of connections um, to other humans. Um, I felt very isolated, even though I had the benefit of many family visits, the visits of many friends. There were times in the dark of night when I felt completely alone in that hospital. And not knowing, not just what would happen in the hospital, but what would happen after that. I'm a, a very social person. I have interactions with colleagues, with students, with families, with friends. What would happen after I got out of the hospital if I couldn't keep up with my former kinds of connections? Another great worry was my loss of connection to nature, something that's deeply important to me, not only because of I work in nature, but also because that is where I get my sense of renewal and my sense of continuity, my sense of beauty uh, in life. I felt that if I could not go hiking into the mountains that I loved, the forest that I loved, I would suffer a very deep loss, and I had no idea whether or not I would be able to return to that. And finally, the loss of function and identity, again, um, as a person who is a full professor at the University of Utah, an R1 institution, I have multiple graduate students, I have grants from the National Science Foundation, I attend conferences, um, I have friends, I have family. Um, what would be, who would be fulfilling the functions that I fulfill um, if, I wasn't, if I was incapacitated by this disturbance? Here's a simple example. Uh, when I had returned from the hospital, but before I went back to work, and I was still suffering from minor traumatic brain injury, I got a call from a reporter at the Boston Globe, and he wanted me to sort of write up a statement about a paper that was being published in science about forests around the world, uh, their global significance, and I knew that to write this paper, I would really have to focus on getting those numbers right, and I knew that I simply wasn't up to it mentally at that time. 
And so I had to compose an email to this reporter and say, you know, I just can't do this. Now, here are three names of other colleagues that might be able to help you. But I felt a deep sense of loss, a deep sense of cutting myself off um, from what was a professional obligation, a professional privilege, in terms of contributing to the scientific record about trees. On a more personal basis, in terms of my function as a mother, my daughter Erica, right here, um, she and I had planned a bicycle trip that summer. We were going to commune as mother and daughter. We were going to function together as mother and daughter at this stage of her life. She's 23 years old. I felt it was an incredible opportunity that she had invited me to do this. And of course, lying on my back in the hospital, I wasn't able to do this. And she reassured me that, Mom, I'll be thinking of you on the bike trip. And I reassured her that I would be with her in spirit. But again, I felt this loss that I was not functioning um, as a mother in this case because of this disturbance. And finally, in terms of connection to my profession, I really felt in terms of my function as a researcher. I have since climbed trees. This last year, this last two months ago, actually, I was climbing in the Pacific Northwest, climbing up some of my old uh, Douglas fir tree friends. Um, but it felt very different. I realized that at any moment, my rope could fail. At any moment, I could have a catastrophic fall. At any moment, there was danger something I had never experienced before. I had always trusted trees and trusted my ropes and trusted the techniques that we've developed over the last 30 years implicitly. And so this was a loss too. Not that I can't climb trees, I can do that. But it's with a different sense, a different feel, a different understanding. And that in a way is a loss I feel too because of that lack of confidence that I once held for myself before the fall. I'll mention one last thing, and that is, um, that concerns something really important in terms of identity. That is, the decisions that we make about life. There are so many decisions that we who are privileged to make, have choices in our lives can do. We work through the different kinds of opportunities, the different kinds of choices that are made available to us. And if we have some sort of sense of passion, some sense of central movement, as I do, to understand forest canopies and understand disturbance of forests, rainforests, and why that's important. Well, that's what I had before I fell. I had this really strong sense of my own destiny, my own importance, my own ability to do something in this world that's important to me. But after the fall, I have found that that arrow has sort of faded away, to be honest. That there are many choices, and in many cases, in all cases, those choices might disappear today if there's another disturbance, or tomorrow, or next year. So what's the point of developing a big research program with graduate students that take five years to go through to get answers to questions that I was previously really thrilled about? What does that mean in terms of my decisions? Does that mean I let it all go? Does that mean I grab randomly? Does that mean I fake it and pretend that I'm as interested as I was? These are questions I just don't have an answer to give to myself or to give to you in terms of where I am now, in terms of recovery, sort of a psychological and professional recovery from that disturbance that I experienced. And it was at that point, just several months ago, that I began thinking about the unansweredness of those kinds of questions, the unansweredness of my function and my identity, that I began to think back to my research about relic trees and pastures, where I've been trying to find answers to questions about disturbance and recovery. And one of the ways that I've tried to do this is through the idea of tapestry thinking. If we don't have all the answers in forest ecology of answering what is the role of these relic trees in maintaining biodiversity and ecosystem function, maybe we can go to other disciplines to look at their theories, their tools, their approaches, and their ways of knowing that we might be able to apply to forest ecology. And in my case, to the disturbance and recovery of my own, of my own life. For example, when we think about the scar that we have of a, of a forest clear cut, we might think about burn trauma. The fact that when you burn a patch of, of, of skin, that that is perhaps in some ways similar to what we see in a clear cut. And perhaps those who are expert, experienced, have theory and tools and an understanding of the recovery of burns, they might have some, some insights into how we could attach this to those theories and ideas uh, to forests that have been disturbed as well. 
And so last year, before my fall, um, I pulled together what I call an interdisciplinary colloquium around the topic of disturbance and recovery. Um, I used the Find a Researcher site on the University of Utah website to look for faculty who are doing research in disturbance and recovery, and I was able to get 10 colleagues, 10 faculty members, who study disturbance and recovery, but in wildly different fields of burn trauma, refugee studies, neurosciences, human development, economics, urban planning, traffic engineering, criminal justice, and modern dance. And we decided to come together for two hours each month to talk about our respective fields, to talk about our investigations of disturbance recovery, and to see whether there might be some commonalities, some emerging themes that come up that might benefit each of us in our separate fields. What I'd like to do to you uh, today is to talk about just um, five of these disciplines, take a subsample of them, that have some, I think, relationship to disturbance and recovery in human health. So far as ecology, my field, those relic trees, uh, refugee studies, human development, and, uh, neuroscience, and urban planning. So just to give you just a super brief idea of what we learned from each other, the faculty member in refugee studies really focuses on the fact that there are populations of people who in their undisturbed state, in South Somalia, in Chad, in uh, Iraq, when they move, when they experience a, a disturbance and are become refugees, political refugees, in the United States, for example, they experience a disturbance and then they go through some process of recovery. And she's been studying those, those populations. In neuroscience, we know that that field has advanced tremendously in the last 30 years when we have an intact brain that's damaged by a trauma, by a stroke, uh, uh, that the neurons are capable of neuroplasticity, that some of those relic neurons, those surviving neurons, can actually change in function and take new functions uh, that promote uh, human health. The field of human development is very interested in disturbance. For example, attachment theory uh, is all about when a child, when a, when a parent disappears due to death or divorce, that child can, can, can sustain severe damage or disturbance. And in fact, that can have implications later on in its life, that it's not as able to form trusting relationships because of the disturbance that happened uh, during that early time. Um, and in urban studies, we know in cities like New Orleans, for example, that suffered the Hurricane Katrina coming through, that the processes of recovery have been very well studied in terms of the kinds of changes, the kind of shifts in terms of population, architecture, and culture that have been promoted by this disturbance that causes it. So some of the, there were, there were a number of emerging themes that came out of these discussions. Um, and I'll talk about five of these as they relate uh, to my recovery. A first theme that all of us agreed with is that pretty much people think that disturbance is a negative thing. When you talk about a forest fire or infestation of bark beetles uh, in an intermountain west forest, for example, we even use negative language of catastrophic burns, of devastating insect outbreaks. So there's a general belief, in fact, that disturbance is a bad thing. But one thing that I learned from the, ref the, the faculty member who studied refugees, she said sometimes there can be positive outcomes from disturbance. For example, in many of the refugee populations coming from Muslim countries, when they come to the United States, the young women are able to get education. They're able to promote themselves in ways that they would never have been able to do if they had stayed in their home country. So actually, disturbance can have some positive as aspects as well. And for me, as I was lying in the hospital bed there, surrounded by the family and friends that had come around and rallied behind me, I realized and I hoped, as I thought about this example of the refugee studies, that maybe, maybe there was some hope that there would be some positive outcomes as well. Another emerging theme is that knowledge enhances the trajectory of recovery. And when we think about uh, neuroplasticity, when we think about the amazing research that's gone on in the neurosciences, to understand that once you have a head injury, it doesn't mean that you, that's it for your brain. There's actually ways, there are mechanisms in which um, neural function can be restored. And so that was very wonderful for me um, as I was sitting there in the ICU, as I was recovering in the hospital. That trajectory of recovery was helped greatly by the knowledge that I was presented with by my doctors, by my nurses, and by my therapists. That was enormously hopeful for me because it meant I wasn't crazy. There's actually such a thing called ICU delirium. There's ICU psychosis. Even though I saw that guy with a rifle 
pointing a gun at myself and my, my son. I learned from my doctors that, in fact, that was not something that was in my brain that was permanent. It was something that would come and go. It was a completely normal thing. So that knowledge was really important. So as you as doctors interact with your patients, at least patients like me, um, please give them knowledge because that can really help um, to enhance the, the, the sense of recovery. Another emerging theme was that the web of relationships is very important in terms of recovery in many systems. For example, in this relic tree forest system, there are some bird species that will never cross that ocean of pasture. They will, if they're pollinators, those plants that are pollinated by them will not be pollinated. But there are other birds and other insects that will cross that ocean of pasture to go out to that single isolated tree, and therefore the flowers will be pollinated, the fruits will be produced, the fruits will be dispersed, and there will be this continuation of the reproductive function of that landscape. And so for me, this web of relationships was very important. For me to know that my parents, uh, my, my brothers and sisters, my husband, my kids, my friends, were concerned about my recovery was very important. And this is just, I'll just give you a few examples of how important this was and how it was manifested in my own recovery. Uh, my daughter Erica, just two days after my fall, she was in Seattle, Washington. She had a bunch of pictures on her on her i on, on her uh, MacBook Pro. She went to a Kinko's. She printed out a bunch of pictures of family, of friends. She put them on a poster board, and that poster board accompanied me to all the different rooms in which I was moved from within the hospital. So even if there were no human beings with me, if my family was absent or friends weren't there. I still had these images of my family and friends that, that kept me connected through this web of relationships. I also subscribed, my family also subscribed me to CaringBridge. CaringBridge is a, is a fabulous tool for, for patients to be in touch with their friends and their family. It, it allows you to write web, sort of a, a, a um, write blogs every week, or anybody can write a blog. You can, people who can subscribe to that Caring Bridge blog can keep in touch with how the, how the recovery is going. Uh, they can write their own comments of encouragement, which can be read at any time. And so over the seven months that I was in the hospital and sort of incapacitated, over 400 people subscribed to Caring Bridge to my site, and we got over 7,000 hits. So that meant like 20 people a day were writing to me saying, hey, Malini, how you're doing? Let me find out how you are. Uh, what can we do? Uh, let me tell you a little joke. Let me send you a poem. So this was a way to keep in touch with people not only who are close physically to me, but people who are distant as well. And finally, one of my uh, really good friends, Chris Maynard, um, took it in his head to make what he called a recover tree. This was a giant branch, and he elicited from all our friends uh, sending in leaves that had little messages on them that would encourage me. And this hung above my hospital bed. It hung above in, in the ICU, in the regular wards, and at home, again, reminding me that I was not isolated. I was still a part of the web of relationships of my former life. The other thing about connecting is not just to other humans, but also connecting to nature. And as all of you know, here in a hospital environment, Basically, nature is kind of nowhere, that we are separated from nature in almost every case. Although I did see those wonderful nature photographs as I walked through the lobby, which I thought was fabulous. Uh, but one of the things that my graduate students did was to make these tissue paper flowers. They knew that they couldn't bring soil and plants into the ICU, so they made these tissue paper flowers, which were very important to me in terms of providing color, providing a connection, providing a thread to that web of connection to nature that was just outside my window. And this is something that isn't something just that belongs to me. There's a huge and growing literature on the importance of views of nature or nature imagery to the recovery of human beings in especially hospital locations. Roger Ulrich published the first very seminal study uh, where he compared the outcome, the health outcomes of people, who, patients who looked out at, um, at trees versus a concrete wall, found that there were fewer days in the hospital, fewer narcotic drugs, fewer nurse complaints, fewer complications. And so we know that, in fact, nature views are very useful in terms of making patients feel less stressful and can actually um, increase their recovery. There are actually a number of companies now that create uh, nature views. Uh, Sky, Sky Factory, for example, creates above ground views and side views of nature so that people can see them even where there might be no windows or access to the outside. And one of the things that I like to 
see promoted is what I, this is something I worked on much earlier, um, is a product called Natureware, where we make botanically correct images on clothing. We make them into attractive jackets like I'm wearing right now. Um, and this is actually the image of a, a wonderful rainforest canopy plant in Costa Rica called Piper Arita. Uh, we printed it on fabric, made this great jacket. It comes with a little hang tag that has information about the biology and conservation. For instance, this is related to black pepper, which is you know the black pepper that you put on your scrambled eggs in the morning. So when I walk through or go to a coffee shop and someone says, wow, I like your jacket, I can say, well, let me tell you about Piper Arena. It's uh, <laughs> the black pepper that you put on your scrambled eggs. And let me tell you how to you know, uh, contribute to the Rainforest Action Network to promote its conservation. So I thought, well, if this is an idea that could work for regular clothes, could it not work in hospitals? Because one of the things I noticed in the hospitals where I was staying is that the nurses uh, and, and my own, my own, my own gowns were like completely dull, completely colorless, completely uninteresting. And so I started a project after I got out of the hospital to create hospital nature wear. Where we and I worked with the Shriners Children's Hospital in Salt Lake City, where I live. We created some pilot um, examples of of trees and outer space symbols and birds and so forth that were placed on patients and nurses scrubs. Um, so that we could actually bring images of nature, not just through windows or through fa these false video screens, but also as people walk through the corridors. So it's an idea. I'd love to hear your response to it, to see if it has any merit. Uh, but it's something that I think might help um, bring this connection, this web of connection, between people who are in hospitals, who are receiving care after disturbance, to connect with nature, if not outside, then inside the hospital. A fourth emergent property is functional shift. That is, that, it's, that components of systems are actually, in some cases, capable of shifting. I talked to you about, uh, just before, about human development, about attachment theory, this idea that if a child loses a parent, then it's sort of doomed uh, to not being able to have trustful relationships. But actually, there can be functional shifts. That is, if an uncle or a grandfather steps in in place, of a father that might have disappeared or died, then that child is much less subject to the disturbance consequences of that might happen from that separation. And so I began thinking about functional shifts in my own recovery. And for instance, my wonderful husband, Jack Longino, did a tremendous amount of functional shifting, which made our lives just remarkably better. And my reassurance that, in fact, we could live, we could continue to live our lives. I was always the one who used to cook breakfast do the laundry, make the beds, and so forth. Uh, well, Jack took that over, and he took it over with joy, as far as I could tell. Um, <laughs> um, and I was so grateful for it. And we've actually retained some of that. Every now and then now, even though I'm perfectly capable of making breakfast, he actually will occasionally make breakfast, too. And I don't think that would have happened um, in previous times, not because of Jack's unwillingness to do it. It's just that there was no void. There was no place for him in which to move into. And so I think that this is a very simple, kind of silly example. But what I learned from it is that other people in my life were able to take on some of the things that I thought I was irreplaceable for. My graduate students took over some of the, the capacity of, of some of the grant projects that I had very easily. They did it without effort. They checked in with me. They talked about it. But they were carrying out the things that I thought I was uniquely suited to. And that was a tremendous lesson also. The fifth and final emergent theme that came out of this was, is what, what we started in our seminar, our colloquium, calling the third state. That is, sort of, we, we tend to think that after a disturbance, there's recovery, and we return to our original state. That's kind of the norm. But what we found is we, we recounted example after example and discipline after discipline that, in fact, this recovery to an original state hardly ever happened. That what would happen is that it would, recur to a, it would recover to a second state, or a third state, or a fourth state, or a fifth state. And so that is something that I really have to think about. And we, we can think of that in terms of the urban planning faculty member, for example, who was studying the effects of Katrina on urban ecology of, of New Orleans, um, had looked and analyzed the, the sort of original neighborhoods the disturbed neighborhoods of, of Katrina's effects, and then following that, what got rebuilt? 
how did those neighborhoods change in terms of culture, in terms of uh, architecture, and in terms of interactions with other, with other neighborhoods? And she found that it did not return to its former state, but instead turned into a third state, a fourth state, and a fifth state. And that's kind of what I have found, too. I mean, I have been able to recover remarkably, um, especially when you sort of go back to me in ICU, uh, me with my walker and my collar and so forth, and then me on my anniversary right here, the anniversary of my fall. This was July 3rd of this year. I went back to my field site in the Olympics. I went back to the very tree that I had fallen out of. I put my hand on that trunk of that tree, and I just burst into tears. But they weren't tears of anger or rancor or sadness or disappointment. It's like this, this rich mix of emotion that I felt as I touched that tree. And I, I sat there for an hour by myself. Then I walked back to my car and I put my backpack on and I solo hiked 38 miles up and over the Olympic Peninsula and uh, did it in two days, I was so happy because that was what I had tried to envision myself as when I was lying in the ICU. Will I ever climb those mountains? Will I ever go into that forest again? And I was very happy to be able to do that. But I'm still at a third state. Why? Because my fibula is still broken. It's a non-union. My doctor, my orthopedist says, you know, it's never gonna heal. And I find that I cannot run more than three miles. After three miles, I just, it hurts too much. So I'm not sort of back to that person who was routinely running half marathons. I can hike over the mountains, I can go on back at work, I can climb trees again, but I'm not quite back to myself. I'm in a third state. Now, when I was talking about this to my brother Mohan yesterday night, you know, he shook his head and he said, Malini, what is with you? You were near death, man. You were like, you were like almost dead. And now you can hike 38 miles, you can run three miles, what are you complaining about? And I said, well, I, I'm not complaining, I'm just recognizing that in fact this disturbance has had an effect on me. I've come to understand it better thanks to the tapestry thinking that I've been able to garner, the understanding that I've been able to get from these other institutions. But you know, I'm still not sure who I am on that bottom line. I'm still not sure who I am now. So I don't have that answer to give to you. But what I would like to do in these last few minutes is to, um, is to play you a very short video that kind of explains maybe where I might be. Thank you. Ross Bierland. I'm one of the chief residents of the Department of Internal Medicine and on behalf of the Department of Medicine I just want to say thank you so much for that excellent talk. I thought it was striking uh, that you know we we often uh, see patients in a time of recovery but we, we don't see them in a time of their disturbance and so uh, perhaps if we could better look at the patient's disturbance uh, and how it affected them so individually and uniquely we could connect with them on a different level and learn something that could help us uh, with our own emotional resilience as we challenge uh, the disturbances that are going to happen in our own lives, whether we see them coming or not. Um, so thank you so much for that. And at this time, I'd like to open the floor to any questions or comments for Dr. Nan Carney. <laughs> I almost never get to ask a question. I'm Marcia Childress from Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. Uh, you talked a lot about and showed us some of those examples of bringing visuals of nature into mm -hmm. more sterile hospital settings, including your uh, tree bough with mm -hmm. all of the leaves from friends. I'm curious too, are there opportunities uh, for us to introduce nature soundscapes mm -hmm. into settings like this? And I was 
moved particularly by your comments about what it was like to be alone at night. Mm -hmm. And what about mm -hmm. nature at night? I think that's a splendid idea. Um, there's, you know, based, uh, sort of growing from that, that one study I mentioned, Roger Olich's study, who just did this very simple metrics looking at, at seeing visual, a uh, real tree and, and not, not and concrete, that has spawned you know, hundreds and hundreds of articles about the use of nature imagery of all kinds in places where there's a nature deficit. And, and its value in terms of cognitive ability, in terms of reduction of stress, in terms of speed of recovery, and so forth. And nature sounds are, are a part of that. There are probably 50 to 100 articles that have focused specifically on, on bringing in nature sounds to people who are deficit. Um, I've been working in prisons a lot, also bringing um, science education and nature conservation projects to, to incarcerated men and women, uh, especially in, in um, and we've been doing that with, nat with nature to the minimum and medium security uh, folks, but we can't do that with the men and women in solitary confinement. So we've been bringing these nature videos in, and one of the comments and things we've recorded in our case studies work and in our surveys has been that it's the sounds that very often trigger their sense of reduction of stress, of calming, of soothing, of loss of a sense of aggression and so forth, which they can then bring with them in sort of a self-regulatory way back to their cells. We've been administering these in their exercise rooms. So I think there's something really there, and because sound can be administered with headphones very easily with an iPod cast, it makes perfect sense that that would be something that could be, I think, fairly easily done. I mean, I don't know the world of hospital administration and what the rules and regs are more familiar with prisons, but, but you guys know, so you know about what is and isn't allowed in terms of uh, administration to, to patients. So I think that, I mean, and again, speaking from my own experience, someone who is attuned to nature sounds, if I had had a podcast or some sort of way to listen to nature sounds, during those empty nights when there was nobody, you know, my family wasn't there or my friends weren't there, it would have been enormously comforting to hear the crickets or to hear the rainforest sounds that, that to me evoke a sense of things are okay, things are all right, you're, you're still connected to nature even though it's not right there. I think that's a great idea. I'm Preston Reynolds and we're all very glad that you are standing before us. Uh, I, I can't see who's I'm here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So we're all very glad that you have survived uh, to share the story. Your parents um, were really a model of resilience. Um, your father, an NIH scientist, um, and both of them from very different spiritual backgrounds. Um, how did their life mm. also open for you different ways of thinking about spiritual growth? now that you're in that phase of your own writing right. and journey? That, that's a great question, and I, I have thought about that quite a bit. I think, I think all my siblings have about, because we had such a, a unique, well, it wasn't unique, I'm sure there are many oddball families out there, uh, but, but we felt ours was sort of different because we grew up in suburban Maryland. My dad worked for the NIH, um, so he'd get into a suit and go out every day. But when we came, he came back, you know, in our home, we'd eat Indian food, we sat on the floor, there was hardly any furniture. I didn't know that people used two sheets, you know, for their beds until I went to patrol camp in sixth grade because, you know, we were sort of living in an Indian household. At the same time, you know, there was the menorah uh, right, right next to Ganesha on our little family <laughs> altar, and we would celebrate Passover, you know, so, so we had this sort of mix. And I think what that told me, number one, what it taught me is that all religions are essentially the same, all spiritual truths are the same. They have different clothing, they have different holidays, and they have different, you know, you, in one religion you can't make an image of, of God, and in the other you have like 8,000 deities that represent God that all look different. So, but what we learned was that the two religions, and therefore all religions, can knit together seamlessly, and that you can therefore find spirituality wherever you would like to find it. And I myself did not find it in Judaism nor with Hinduism, although I respect both religions, but I, found my, I find my spirituality in nature. I find that as my holy place. It is a place where I happen to work, but it is also a place where I renew myself, where I feel connected, where I feel I am not alone, which is really, I think, the essence of what spirituality is about. I think the other thing is that my parents, um, their life together revealed to us, to me anyway, that despite prejudices that, might, that outsiders might inflict, negative judgments, 
Like, my parents couldn't get married in Washington, D.C. in 1951. Why? Because my dad had dark skin. And so that was considered miscegenation. He was considered an African American. They had to go to New York State to get married. So our own nation's capital didn't even honor a marriage between these two. But I never felt as a child that there was anything different, really, or, or wrong or disastrous about my four brothers and sisters and me. And I think that was another gift that they gave us, another way that I have come to say, you know, traffic engineering and urban studies and human development and economics and forest ecology and medicine, they're all kind of the same. And they, there's no judgment. I don't feel any judgment from all of you because I don't, I'm not wearing my white coat. So I, I sort of walk through life with this sense that I'm okay. And I think a lot of that comes from my parents who said, we're okay. And it wasn't that it was easy necessarily, and who knows what went beyond closed doors in terms of their own sense of their place in the world. But as, as a child of theirs, I feel completely accepted in terms of who I am, what I try to do for the world. Now you're not okay. <laughs> this is what I lived with. <laughs> um, my name is Tlaham, and uh, I was touched by your speech. I think this is one of the powerful speech that I have I ever heard in my life. Mm. Um, I am a person, um, I'm here as a result of disturbances. I am a, a refugee from Ethiopia. I see. I came 10 years back here, now I'm a DNP student, uh, just uh, ready to finish, you know, wrap up my... Uh, so, uh, disturbances, technically, if we uh, utilize them properly, can open uh, another chance and uh, opportunity. And um, thank you for uh, giving us this powerful speech. Uh, I think it's, it was uh, amazing. Thank you very much. I think, you know, you were saying how, and I, when I was interacting with my colleague who works with refugees, she talks about how difficult it is to assess the effect of refugee movement. On the one hand, you're forced to flee, you give up your home, you give up your friends, you give up the land, you give up so many things when you have to come to another country. On the other hand, as she said, as I talked about, there are some opportunities here that you can't, you know, that you couldn't get in your home country, so that's a positive. Um, and there are what she called anchor families, those families who hold on to their culture, their costumes, their food, and they become very important members of the refugee communities where they live because they are holding on to that. But then there's a negative part of that, which is, well, if you hold on to that, then you're not, you're not being sort of free and part of the, of the society where you are here. And so there's this constant plus minus, plus minus. And I think all of us as perhaps Western human beings are very uncomfortable with that plus minus, plus minus. We want to hear is it plus or is it minus? And that's how I feel about my own disturbance and perhaps you and maybe other refugees feel about their disturbance that in fact there are pluses and minuses, can I hold them together in my hand and accept that there are both? Or do I have to somehow push the negative so that it's all positive, or push the positive so that it's all negative? And again, I don't have the answer to that, but I think it's really interesting to know that in all of the disciplines that, that I pulled together, the representatives spoke about this, this bifurcation, this, this, this plural, plurality of emotions or assessment that we have to deal with if we're thinking about disturbance and recovery. And that is a challenge, I think, for all of you who are always dealing with disturbance and recovery, I would think that there's this, this positive negative always going on. Okay, well, then anybody else want any questions or comments or anything? Well, help me in thanking Dr. Ned Carney one last time. Thank you.